Um, I <clears throat> understand that um, you all were told we'd start at about 11.30, so I will wait uh, another two minutes till we get started. Uh, I noticed that some uh, folks are just signing on right now. Uh, went off and found something else useful to do, I guess, for, for 30 minutes. Um, it's been a crazy winter here in Virginia, by the way. Uh, about a week ago, it was 2 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, on Sunday, it was 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So we've been up and down and uh, never quite know what the weather is going to be here uh, in the, in the wintertime. Okay, well, it's just about 11.30, so I think it's probably time to get started. Um, today's webinar is the third of three parts uh, having to do with multivariate data analysis uh, using Stack Graphics Centurion. Uh, it's going to be the third and at least for the time being the final part uh, of this particular series uh, on multivariate data analysis. Uh, we'll be doing, uh, continuing to do the webinars uh, and actually we have a, a lot of very interesting things uh, planned for 2014. So it's, it's going to be an exciting year for Stat Graphics. Uh, webinars and a lot of other things we'll all be telling you all about uh, over the coming months. Um, so uh, let's get started. It, it is 11.30 and um, <coughs> the topic uh, of Today's webinar is multivariate data analysis using Stack Graphics Centurion. Um, now, I've showed you this slide before in the other two webinars that had to do with multivariate statistics. Um, the fact that multivariate data analysis talks about the simultaneous observation and analysis of more than one response variable. Uh, <clears throat> those of you who, who did tune in for the first to two seminars, know that the first seminar we did was primarily on data reduction and structural uh, simplification. Um, there we talked about things like uh, principal components analysis, neural networks, and that sort of thing. The second webinar um, that we did about a month ago had to do with sorting and grouping. We talked about cluster analysis, discriminant analysis, uh, and so forth. Um, Today we're going to be looking at four interesting multivariate procedures um, that cover some of the other uh, areas of interest in multivariate statistical methods. Um, one of those is the dependence uh, amongst different variables. Um, another is prediction. And finally, uh, we also need to talk a little bit about hypothesis construction and testing. Uh, for those of you who are interested in reading more about multivariate statistical methods, uh, Johnson and Wishern is one of the major references that we've used in developing the procedures for stack graphics. So you might want to uh, have a chance, if you do have a chance, to take a look at that particular book. Okay, now the four topics uh, that I've chosen, the four methods uh, to talk about today are methods that are very important, but perhaps not as widely used as, as they might be. Um, the first that we'll be talking about is something called correspondence analysis. Uh, this is a procedure similar to principal components analysis in that it deals with the reduction of dimensionality uh, and visualization. Uh, but whereas principal components analysis primarily deals with measurement data, correspondence analysis deals with categorical data, data that falls into categories. Um, and I've chosen it as an example to look at uh, the various research proposals that were submitted to a funding agency uh, and to see how the amount of funding these research proposals uh, obtained depended upon what subject area they fell in. Uh, second topic I'll be looking at is multiple correspondence analysis. Uh, multiple correspondence analysis is widely used in looking at surveys and the relationship between questions and responses on surveys. And that is, in fact, the example that I'll be using. 
Third method of the day will be multivariate analysis of variance, MANOVA. Here we'll be looking at a designed experiment, uh, a good factorial design in which there were three responses. And whereas a, a univariate analysis of variance would look at each response separately, a multivariate analysis of variance would look at the three response variables together. And then finally, uh, the fourth topic we'll be looking at is partial least squares. Uh, partial least squares is a method for developing uh, mathematical models relating a set of x variables to a set of y variables. And the example I've selected has to do with evaluating a stock portfolio. So I, I, I've tried to uh, vary the applications here, the application areas, to hopefully have something that would be of interest to, to everyone who's tuned in. Now the first topic we'll be talking about is correspondence analysis. Uh, as I mentioned just a moment ago, correspondence analysis is similar to principal components analysis in that it looks for a small number of dimensions that explain most of the variability uh, in a set of data. Where it's different than principal components analysis, though, is that it applies to categorical data. Now, uh, correspondence analysis, which was developed in France, incidentally, is traditionally applied to contingency tables to two by two tables where the rows and columns of the tables represent categories of, of, of two different variables. And that is in fact uh, the way we'll be looking at it, the example we'll be looking at. Primary output of correspondence analysis is a map. A map in a low dimensional space where we can plot the different categories of those categorical variables in a way that hopefully gives us insights into the relationships that exist between those categories. Very powerful procedure, a very much an exploratory data analysis of visualization procedure uh, applied this time though to contingency tables. Now the data set we're going to be looking at for the what's sometimes called simple correspondence analysis um, is a data set from the very excellent book uh, called Correspondence Analysis in Practice, uh, which was written by Michael Greenacre. Uh, if you're interested in correspondence analysis, that's really a book that you should have. Uh, it explains and illustrates uh, in very clear way uh, the mathematics behind correspondence analysis uh, and what you would hope to achieve. Now the data set uh, is in a data file called funding.sgd. This is a data file that is shipped with StackGraphic Centurion. Uh, so if you've installed StackGraphic on your computer, you have this particular data set already. Um, what it deals with is 796 research proposals that were submitted to a research agency. Um, the primary section of interest uh, for this particular data is the the blue section that I've outlined on, on my slide here, uh, consisting of 10 rows and then the columns out through column E. Um, it, this is a contingency table and if you added up all the numbers in the blue area, you'd see that they added to 796. Uh, each of those research proposals now, those 796 proposals, has been classified Number one, according to the subject matter. Okay, is it a, a proposal in geology or biochemistry or chemistry or zoology and so forth? Uh, likewise, they've also been classified according to what sort of funding they received. Uh, level A, if you're in column A of this particular table, you received a very high level of funding. Uh, column B uh, is a slightly lower level of funding. C, a lower level yet, and D, a very low level of funding. Uh, column E actually represents proposals that were not funded at all. And what we're interested in understanding is what sort of relationships exist uh, amongst the patterns in this table 
between, for example, the different subjects and between the different funding levels. Okay. Now, there are a couple uh, additional rows at the bottom called supplementary, <laughs> supplementary rows, uh, museums and math sciences, which will plot on the map that we eventually make, but we won't use as part of the mathematical analysis. Okay. There's also a supplemental column uh, Y uh, over here on the far right uh, of the table, which counts the number of, as I remember, it was young researchers um, in the data set. Um, they, they, again, will not be part of the analysis, but they will be plotted on the maps. Okay. Now, to start this off, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this contingency table and start by looking at it using the procedure in Stack Graphics, the very heavily used procedure designed for looking at contingency tables. So at this point, let me go uh, into Stack Graphics Centurion and open up that data set called Funding. If I go to File, Recent Data Files, because I was looking at this the other day, uh, I should see a file called funding. No, I don't. You know, I've been looking at other things too. I, I'll have to go into my webinar folder and actually find it. There it is, funding.sgd. Okay. Uh, as promised, we have information on 796 research proposals. Now, to analyze this particular data, using the contingency tables procedure, uh, which is sort of the procedure you would learn about in your first course in statistics. You'd go to describe categorical data contingency tables. Now, uh, for the purpose of this table, I want to look at the five funding levels, A, B, C, D, and E. Okay. I, I'm not going to worry about uh, column Y, which was the young re uh, researchers. For subject, I'm going to put that in the labels field. Uh, typically, the row labels are entered in a column. You can see it here called subject. Column labels are picked up automatically from the names of the columns. I'm also going down to the select field, and I'm going to type in the select field first open parens, 10, close parens. Uh, that's going to tell it to ignore those supplemental rows, rows 11 and 12, in doing the contingency table. All right. um, it's going to offer me, uh, the contingency tables procedure, a number of tables and graphs. I'm going to take the defaults plus, I'd also like it to give me some tests of independence. Okay, now, <clears throat> what it's done is it's taken this data, this basically two by two table, and created some text output and some graphics output. Of primary interest, of major interest, at least I think it's interesting, is the mosaic plot. The mosaic plot uh, is a very nice way of looking at what we call the row profiles. Okay. In the mosaic plot, it's going to take every row of the contingency table and draw bars where the length of the bars are proportional to the counts in a particular funding area. So, for example, if you look at geology, you notice that bar C is considerably longer than the other bars. Okay, the highest percentage of research proposals in geology uh, received funding level C, which was sort of a relatively low amount of funding. Uh, you can see the same thing for biochemistry, for chemistry, and so forth. At the same time, the width of the bars is proportional to the total number of proposals in a particular subject area. So, for example, you can see that chemistry and physics have the widest bars. There were more proposals in those areas than there were in, for example, biochemistry or statistics. 
um, that are uh, considerably narrower at the bars. Okay. So this is a very important plot. And if you look at the percentages across each row, those we'll call, when we get to the correspondence analysis, the row profiles. One thing I'm interested in in a table of data like this, a contingency table, is what relationships exist between the row profiles. You know, what profiles are similar to which other profiles? Are there profiles that are considerably different than others? Okay. And I'd like to be able to come up with some sort of a map where I can lay out, for example, the different subject areas and hopefully subjects that are similar to each other with respect to these profiles will be close together on the map. Those that are considerably different will, will be far apart on the map. Now I think you can see that there are, in fact, differences amongst these profiles. If you look at biochemistry, for example, you'll notice there aren't many proposals in biochemistry. Uh, most of the ones that did come in, though, were either funded at level C or were not funded at all. You might recall that level E represents no funding. So actually, biochemistry and engineering didn't get a lot of funding. On the other hand, geology, uh, most of the proposals were, in fact, funded. Uh, if you look at the upper end, uh, category A, that's the most level of funding. You'll notice that physics and statistics were actually funded at a high level more frequently than um, some of the others. So the mosaic plot can be, can be quite useful, and if you divide things up proportionally within each row, We'll call that the row profile. Now, if I right-click, go to pane options, and ask for a vertical mosaic plot instead of a horizontal mosaic plot, we'll see what are called the column profiles. In this case, it'll take each column, column A, column B, column C, column D, column E, and divide them up proportionally to how often each subject area occurs within each column. And you can see some of the same things in the column profiles that you were seeing in the row profiles. For example, look at funding level A. You see an awful lot of orange, a fairly high percentage of proposals that were funded at a high level were in physics. Okay. Now, that's the mosaic plot in a very interesting way of looking at a contingency table. Also of considerable interest is the test for independence down here at the lower left. The standard test for independence in a contingency table is a chi-square test. If I go back to my PowerPoint slide for just a moment, uh, I've actually written down an equation for the chi-square test. The chi-square test is used to, at, to test the hypothesis that the row categories are unrelated to the column categories. What you do is you actually look at every cell of the contingency table and calculate first off how many proposals you would expect to see in every cell of the contingency table if subject area was completely unrelated to, in our case, funding level. And then you add across all rows and columns the observed count minus the expected count under the independence hypothesis. Take the observed minus the expected, square it and divide by the expected add across all the cells, and you get what's called the chi-square statistic. If the chi-square statistic is large, that means the observed numbers are considerably different than the expected numbers, which would indicate, in fact, a dependency between rows and columns. Um, the chi-square test also gives you a p-value. If the p-value is small, you know, below 0.05, and it certainly is in this case, 
it indicates that there is, in fact, a significant difference. That's I'm not a difference, significant degree of dependence between the row and column classifications. Okay, now that is sort of the standard analysis of a contingency table, the standard chi-square test you would have seen at, in the first you know, course on statistics. What we'd like to do now, though, is dig a little bit deeper uh, into those row and column profiles and also into this chi-square statistic to see if we can identify what categories contribute most to the significant result that we're seeing here. I mean, once we know that there are dependencies between rows and columns, it would be nice to be able to visualize where those differences exist. And to do this, to do that, we want to run a correspondence analysis. Now, the way to run a correspondence analysis in stat graphics is to go to the describe menu. To go to, to describe multivariate methods correspondence analysis. Okay, now the correspondence analysis procedure is set up to take data in two different formats. It'll take it in untabulated format or tabulated format. Untabulated data would be, well, for example, if I took every one of my 796 research proposals and created a row for each proposal and then put in the subject area and the funding level of each proposal separately, I could have the program go ahead and count how often each subject area occurred, how often each funding level occurred. That would be untabulated data. In our case, though, we have tabulated data. We've already counted how often each subject area occurs and how often each subject area has been given each level of funding. So I'll go down and, and, and I'll turn on the radio button for tabulated. The columns I'm going to add here now, I'm going to put in columns A through Y. Remember, A through E are the data I really want to analyze. Uh, column Y is a supplemental column that I, uh, I don't really want to analyze, but I'd like to plot on the map. I'll also take subject and put that in where it says row labels, okay, and then press OK. Now, the second dialog box that will come up will be the analysis options dialog box. It's going to ask me in a manner similar to a principal components analysis how many dimensions I wish to extract. Now, um, you can extract up to one less than the smallest number of categories. So in this case, funding level, there were five funding levels, A, B, C, D, and E. One less than that is four, so I could extract up to four dimensions. Most of the time, the first couple dimensions, as in a principal components analysis, will capture most of the variability among the counts in that contingency table. Okay, and it's much easier to plot things in two dimensions uh, than in more than two. I'm also going to indicate to the program that the last two rows that I've specified are supplementary, and also that the last column uh, I specified was supplementary. Okay. Put that in and press OK. And then it's going to give me, as always, a list of tables and graphs. I'm going to take all the standard plus the row and the column profiles. Okay. Now, uh, let's take a look at what came up when we did the correspondence analysis. In the top left, we see the contingency table. And as you'll note, uh, for the analysis, uh, it picked up the first 10 rows of my table. It picked up columns A to E. There were 796 research proposals in total. Okay, that is the contingency table. Down here, 
you will see the row and column profiles. The row and column profiles show you the proportional breakdown in each row and each column. For example, if you look at the geology row under row profiles, and look at the numbers for A, B, C, D, and E, they add up to one, as do the numbers in the biochemistry row, the chemistry row, and so forth. You'll notice if you look at the numbers, for example, under geology funding level C, it says 0.459. 45.9% of all geology proposals we're given funding level C. Okay, those are the row profiles. Now, if I thought about plotting out these row profiles, I would typically have to plot them out in a five-dimensional space. For example, I could take uh, each row here, columns A, B, C, D, and E, and plot those five numbers in a five-dimensional space if I knew how to do that. Okay? And if I did that, if I plotted every row in a five-dimensional space, some rows would be close to each other, some wouldn't. Okay? Well, I don't know how to plot in five-dimensional space, which is why in a correspondence analysis you try to reduce the dimensionality. And in fact, if I now go to the middle table here, which says inertia and chi-square decomposition, it will show you how much of the variability, or actually how much of the chi-square statistic you could represent by a single dimension. Okay? In that five-dimensional space, there is one direction which represents about 47% of that chi-square statistic which measures the difference between the observed and expected values. If I take the first two dimensions, I can represent about 84% of the chi-square statistic. Now I have a slide uh, for you back in the um, PowerPoint presentation that talks a little bit about this. Um, this particular table is an important table in the contingent uh, correspondence analysis because that chi-square statistic and in particularly the cumulative percent show me the contribution of each dimension to that test of independence. And about 84% can be represented by the first two dimensions. There's also a column labeled inertia. Inertia measures the amount of variability along a principal dimension. And in fact, inertia is chi-squared divided by the sample size. Uh, so it's a related statistic uh, that corresponds to how much variability there is amongst those profiles, if you like. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm hoping to get uh, if I go back to stack graphics, out of all of this is in fact a map. Uh, the primary output of the correspondence analysis is a correspondence map. Okay, and I'm going to start by actually plotting just columns. Okay, here is a plot of the data, actually the column profiles, columns A, B, C, D, and E, with respect to the first dimension in the horizontal direction, that is the dimension of primary variability, and the second dimension along the vertical axis. Um, as indicated before, about 84% of the variability amongst the profiles is represented by these first two dimensions. Now, what are they? Well, I think that you can see that dimension number one represents the difference between different levels of funding. A was high funding, B was somewhat less than that, C was somewhat less than that, and D was a minimal level of funding. 
So basically, the first dimension here represents how much funding you got if you were funded. To the left is a high level of funding, to the right, uh, a low level of funding. The second dimension is primarily a contrast of A, B, C, and D against E. You might recall that E meant no funding. So where you fall along the second dimension really corresponds to how often you're not funded compared to how often you're funded. So remember that. The dimension number one is the amount of funding. Dimension number two, whether you're funded or not funded. I say remember that because I'm going to push the right mouse button, go to pane options, and tell it to plot rows instead of columns. And now what you'll see is a point on my map for each of the 10 subject areas that went into the contingency table, and also, incidentally, the two supplemental rows, math, sciences, and museums. And now I look at this, and remembering how these dimensions were defined in terms of funding levels, I notice physics on the left-hand side, okay, compared to, for example, zoology, botany, museums, and so forth on the right-hand side. Physics proposals, if they're funded, tend to get funded at a high level, much higher than proposals such as zoology or botany, which don't get funded as heavily. Dimension two, you might remember, was whether you got funded compared to whether you received no funding. Geology and museums, which are at the lower end of dimension two, are almost always funded. On the other hand, engineering and biochemistry at the high side uh, are often not funded. Now, if you want to have even more fun, you can go and plot uh, rows and columns at the same time. Um, so you can remember, oh yeah, physics is often the direction of a high level of funding, zoology and a low level of funding, engineering, biochemistry, they're up uh, toward the E uh, category, which was no funding. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about this map, of course, is I've plotted it all in two dimensions, and now by looking basically at the distance between points on the map, I can see what subject areas are similar to which other subject areas, what funding levels are similar to which other funding levels. So it's a correspondence map of the data in the contingency table. Now, um, that's pretty much uh, what I'm looking for in stat graphics. Uh, you will remember if, if you were in sat into either of the first two webinars that our colleague Christian Charles uh, in France, uh, who represents and, and distributes stat graphics in France for us, has another program, a program called Uniwin Plus, uh, which is designed uh, to do multivariate methods and actually offers some additional output um, over and beyond what Stat Graphics Centurion does. Um, this is a, a, a plot from Uniwin Plus, uh, a very similar plot to what I just showed you, where you see both the subject matters plotted and the funding levels A, B, C, D, and E. Um, it's slightly different than the stack graphics output in that component number one is reverse left to right. Uh, actually, the Uniwin Plus, this is exactly how it looks in Greenacre's map, uh, Greenacre's book uh, on correspondence analysis. It's um, completely arbitrary, actually, negative versus positive uh, in terms of how the maps are created. The one thing that Christian has does, done on this particular output that we did not see in stack graphics 
is he has scaled the size of the point symbols. In this case, the size of the point symbols are squared according to the cosines of the angles between uh, the different profiles. Now basically, uh, the larger the point symbol, the better that profile is represented by this projection into two dimensions. Uh, so funding levels like D and E are better represented, for example, than funding levels as C and A. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's a it's a, a nice modification to the plot. And if you get a chance to look at Uniwin Plus, uh, as I said, it reads uh, Stack Graphics data files and makes it quite easy uh, to generate some other plots. Um, you'll you'll see some other interesting plots of the same data. Now, um, that's pretty much all I wanted to say about a simple correspondence analysis, um, because I, I need to also talk about a multiple correspondence analysis. Now, a multiple correspondence analysis is different than a simple correspondence analysis, because it deals primarily with the associations within a single set of variables. I think I told you before that the major application of multiple correspondence analysis is to look at responses to surveys. The goal of the multiple correspondence analysis is similar to that of a simple correspondence analysis in that we want, would like to understand just how strongly and in what way the different variables are related. Now, this will all make uh, more sense, I think, if we take a look at a particular set of data. And the data I want to look at here is another uh, data set from Michael Greenacre's book on correspondence analysis. It's data from a survey. In this particular survey, 3,418 respondents were asked four questions regarding women in the workplace. Now, Mr. Greenacre doesn't tell us exactly what the questions were, but basically each of those 3,418 respondents had to answer four separate questions. There were four responses to each of the four questions. The four responses are represented by an uppercase W, a lowercase W, an uppercase H, or a question mark. What they correspond to, uppercase W, uh, means work full-time. A lowercase W means work part-time. An H means stay at home. And a question mark means no opinion. So for example, if you look at row one, row one, the person who answered that question, the response to question one was work full time. The response to question two was stay at home. The response to questions three and four was work part time. Now, what we're interested in knowing is how the different responses to the different questions are related to each other. Okay, did people, for example, that responded stay at home to question one, tend to respond stay at home to questions two, three, and four? Or were there differences with those questions eliciting something different from the respondents? Okay. Now, to run a correspondence analysis, I'll need multiple correspondence analysis, I'll need to go back to stack graphics, clear out the current uh, data sheet, and Statfolio. And now I'm going to open up a file called survey, survey.sgd. Now what you see in this particular file are 3,418 rows. You see for each respondent 
the, their response for question one, for question two, for question three, for question four, and then some supplemental information. C is the country of the respondent. G is the gender, male or female. Uh, MA represents marital status, married, single, divorced, or whatever. Okay. To do a multiple correspondence analysis, I'll go to describe multivariate methods, multiple correspondence analysis. Okay. Now, the columns that I want to analyze, I'll, first off, I need to pick all of the questions question one, question two, question three, and question four. I also thought it would be interesting to put gender in, not as part of the analysis, but to have it included as a supplemental column on my maps. Okay, so we'll start off by indicating Q1 through Q4 plus gender. Push OK. The second dialog box that comes up is the correspondence analysis options dialog box. Here it's going to ask me first off how many dimensions do I want to extract? And I'll say, well, you know what, I, I, I think I'll extract two dimensions. Again, I like to plot things uh, in two dimensions. Are there any supplemental points? And here I'm going to put a one indicating that that last column is supplemental, which means don't include it in the analysis, just put it on the map. And then finally, it's going to ask me whether I would like to analyze an indicator matrix or a BERT matrix. Now, this is a place where I need to go back to my PowerPoint slides and tell you what that all means. What I'm going to do you saw me click the radio button, is I'm going to tell the procedure to create and analyze an indicator matrix. Now, what it'll do if I ask it to create an indicator matrix is it will take each of the questions and create a column for each response to each of the questions. So it'll create a column like Q1 dot question mark, Q1 dot H, Q1 dot W, Q1 dot lowercase w for the four possible responses to question one. It'll also create four columns for question two, for question three, and for question four. Each row represents one possible pattern of responses. So for example, row one uh, and count is how many people answered this way. Only one person answered this way. Uh, you'll see that there's a one in the Q1 dot capital W column. So they answered work full time to question one. Uh, question two, the one is in the H column. So to question two, they answered stay home. To question three, the one is in the Q3 dot lowercase w column, so they answered work part-time to question three, and to question four, also work part-time. So the indicator matrix will have a one for the response to each question, whatever the response was to that particular question, and a zero for all the other possible responses. In a multiple correspondence analysis, what we do if we ask it to, which I did, is it will actually run a simple correspondence analysis on this indicator matrix. And what we'll see on our maps is we'll see a point for every response to every question. And we'll be able to identify responses that were similar to each other in terms of the pattern uh, versus responses that were different. Now that's called an indicator matrix. Another way that the multiple correspondence analysis procedure is run is by analyzing instead of the indicator matrix, the BERT table. 
Okay, and it gives practically the same results, only the scaling is somewhat different. What a birth table does, you might be interested in, in this, is it takes every response to every question. So there's four questions, four responses to each question. That's a total of 16. It makes 16 rows and 16 columns. In a particular cell, it indicates how often respondents answered whatever is in that row and whatever is in that column. So 362 respondents answered, I don't know, to question one. The Q1, Q1 the diagonals here are, are, are like identities. I mean, it's the same response to the same question. More interesting, though, is if you look over a little bit, you'll see a 196. 196 respondents said, I don't know, question mark, on both question one and question two. If you go over here to question three, dot question mark, 204 answered, I don't know, to question one and question three. Uh, and 264 uh, responded uh, the same way to question one and question four. You can ask the procedure to do a multiple correspondence analysis on a BERT table instead of an indicator table. Things will be scaled a little bit differently, but typically the conclusions uh, are quite similar. Okay? So that's really what I'm interested in. I'm interested in the four responses to the four different questions. Now going back to stack graphics, I've asked it here to analyze the indicator variable. Uh, and I will just go ahead and take the defaults coming in. Okay. It'll now create for me, well, a couple things. It'll show me a table with the inertia and chi-square decomposition and it will also show me a map. If you look at the inertia and chi-square decomposition, you'll see that actually two dimensions represents, in this case, only about 40% of the variability. Um, those are still two dimensions that represent most of the variability, but it's not as complete, for example, as the, the funding example we looked at before. We can also, though, look over here at the correspondence map. And right now it looks like a mess because it's put both the rows and the columns on the map. I'm going to right click, go to any options, and tell it don't plot the rows. Okay. Now what it's done is it's plotted a very interesting map for me. There are 16 points, the four responses for each of the four questions, plus actually two points for gender, male and female. Points that are very close together on the map indicate responses with a very similar pattern uh, amongst my 3,000 and some respondents. Now, if you want to interpret the dimensions, dimension one is quite clear. Right? Dimension one basically he contrasts the people with no opinion to the people that did have an opinion. You see there's a very similar pattern in the data for the I don't knows on question one, two, three, and four. The distance between the points here represents how similar the responses are, those responses are on, on those particular questions. So people that don't know, don't know on almost all the questions. On the other hand, dimension two represents something a little bit harder to interpret. Um, as I remember Greenacre's book, he talked about dimension two representing uh, how traditional or liberal their responses were uh, to the questions. For example, you can see high on the second dimension, stay home 
for question one and stay home for question four versus down at the bottom, go to work, work full time for question two and work full time for question three. So there's the H's definitely tend to be at the upper end of dimension two, the capital W's at the lower end of dimension two. Very interesting way of analyzing survey data. Um, and you can see, uh, I think that uh, there's a lot of interesting things to see. You also see, incidentally, that males and females are very close together on this particular map, meaning that the responses of the males were very similar to the responses of the females. Okay, well that is the primary output of the multiple correspondence analysis, uh, that correspondence map. Um, UNUIN Plus, um, the um, complementary program to Stack Graphics, as I said, written by uh, Christian Charles uh, over in France for us, does some additional output. He, he also has a, a procedure to do multiple correspondence analysis. And one of the interesting things uh, that UNUIN Plus does in the multiple correspondence analysis, I noticed as, as I was running this yesterday, uh, was that it actually constructs a test of how significant each column is to the correspondence analysis. In, uh, in this case, to the first uh, dimension, I believe it is. And um, it's, these tests are structured in such a way that if you get a test value greater than three, it indicates a column that's important to the analysis. Now what you can see if you look down here is columns that are most important for the first dimension. And you can see this says for the first uh, axis are columns 1, 5, 9, and 13. Those are incidentally all the question marks. You may remember the question marks occurred in columns 1, 5, 9, and 13 of the indicator matrix. So the most important contributors to the first dimension are columns 1, 5, 9, and 13. After that, the contribution falls off, although if you use the rule test value greater than 3 are columns that are important to the analysis, a lot of the other columns are also important but perhaps less so uh, than the columns with the question marks. Okay. If you get a chance to try UNWIN Plus, you'll see uh, additional output like this that can be quite helpful in supplementing the multiple correspondence analysis. Okay. Well, that is the second procedure I wanted to talk about today. Um, let's move on to the third procedure. The third procedure I wanted to talk about was the multivariate analysis of variance, uh, often called a MANOVA. <clears throat> what a multivariate analysis of variance does, and, and now we're going to be back to looking primarily at measurement data, is it extends a univariate analysis of variance to the case of multiple dependent variables. Uh, you know, typically, if we run an experiment, we may measure several things. Usually, we analyze each response separately. You know, if we run an experiment, we measure yield, and we measure clarity, and we measure viscosity, or whatever it might be. It's the standard approach is to do an analysis of variance on yield, do a separate analysis of variance on viscosity, a separate analysis of variance on clarity. A MANOVA actually allows us to do a simultaneous test on multiple responses at the same time. What you end up doing is testing hypotheses about a vector of means, 
where the vector uh, is a function of the mean of each of the response variables. Now, best thing to do is to show you an example. And I pulled an example uh, to illustrate the multiple analysis of variance from the book that I mentioned earlier by uh, Johnson and Wishern called Applied Multivariate Statistical Analysis. Uh, they describe an experiment involving film. And incidentally, the data file is also one distributed with stack graphics, one called film.sgd. The experiment has to do with looking at treatments of film. There are two primary experimental factors that were changed. The first factor in column one was the rate of extrusion. And you can see that the rate of extrusion was tested at two levels, minus 10 and plus 10. I gather what they did is they took their standard rate of extrusion, reduced it by 10, and also increased it by 10 to see if they could see what the effect of changing that extrusion rate would be on the film. They also experimented with two different amounts of an additive. You can see that additive, some of the runs are at a level of one, some are at one and a half. What this design was is actually a simple two by two factorial design. There are two levels of extrusion, two levels of, of additives for four different combinations, and each combination was tested five times. So it's a replicated two by two factorial, where each of the four points was run five times. The rightmost columns, tear resistance, gloss, and opacity, are three responses. Every time they did an experiment for each of the 20 experiments, they measured the tear resistance, they measured the gloss, and they measured the opacity. What we would like to know is whether extrusion rate and amount of additive affect these three responses. Okay? And I'm trying to frame it in a multivariate sense. Does the extrusion rate and the amount of additive affect these three responses, or does it not? But well, we could do a univariate analysis of variance and test whether they affect each response separately. But it turns out that if the responses are correlated, it's better if we can do a multivariate test. Now, why do a multivariate test? Well, there are several reasons why one might want to do a simultaneous test of all three responses rather than separate tests of each. Okay, first off, if I tested, does extrusion, for example, affect tear resistance? And then tested, does it affect loss? And then tested, does it affect opacity? Okay, and I ran each of those three tests with a 5% type 1 error, meaning that I might conclude there was an effect when I shouldn't with a 5% probability, what happens is if you m run multiple tests on multiple variables, your overall error rate tends to go up. You know, if I run a test with a 5% error on one response and then a, another 5% test on another response and a 5% test on a third response, I might make a mistake someplace as much as 15% of the time by running a single test on all the responses simultaneously, I can keep the error rate down at 5%. So that's one major reason. Rather than doing lots of tests and getting too many false alarms, more false alarms than I might anticipate, um, it might be better to test them simultaneously. Secondly, a multiple analysis of variance can sometimes detect dependencies 
which would not be detected otherwise. Mm -hmm. It can be a more powerful test if those variables are related to each other, if they're correlated. You know, you can imagine that if you had an effect which wasn't really strong, it was there but not really strong, it might get buried in the noise if you tested each response variable separately. But if you saw that weak signal, you know, three separate times, in a multivariate sense, that signal might be strong enough to be statistically significant. Now, reading a little bit uh, about the MANOVA uh, in preparation for the webinar here, uh, several authors did mention that this MANOVA is most effective when the response variables are moderately correlated. When you have a correlation coefficient between your response variables of somewhere between maybe 0.04 and 0.7. Okay. Um, if the variables are not correlated, you don't gain anything. Okay? You might as well just look at each variable separately. There's nothing to be learned by looking in a multivariate sense. On the other hand, if they're too strongly correlated, then there's no need really to look at more than one response. And you do incidentally sacrifice degrees of freedom, one degree of freedom, in the multivariate sense for each response you add. Okay, so if they're very highly correlated, you may be giving away a little bit of a power rather power as opposed to just looking at, at a single response. I should also mention that um, a MANOVA is a very good approach if you're looking at what are called repeated measures design. Repeated measures designs are experiments in which multiple measurements have been made on the same individual or same item. Classic example is you give a patient a drug that's designed to reduce their heart rate. You measure their heart rate after 15 minutes, after 30 minutes, after 45 minutes, after 60 minutes. So you measure it several different times on the same individual. Well, those measurements, because they came from the same individual, are likely to be correlated so that the errors associated with those repeated measurements are not the same as when you look at different individuals. A multivariate analysis of variance is a good approach for analyzing those types of experiments. Now, I'll be talking about that a little bit more uh, in a future webinar when we look uh, more deeply at, at some other types of experimental designs. Uh, I'll just remind you right now that it is a good approach for analyzing repeated measures designs. Okay, now, where do we go in stack graphics to do a MANOVA? Well, the first thing I want to do here is I actually want to clear off the data that I was looking at and open up the experiment file. It's actually a file called film. Yeah, there it is. It's a total of 20 rows and five columns. We're looking at tear resistance, gloss, and opacity, <coughs> excuse me, as a function of rate of extraction and the amount of additive. Okay, now, to do a MANOVA, we need to use the general linear models procedure. So we need to go to compare, analysis of variance, general linear models. Okay, it's the GLM procedure. <clears throat> the way we run it is where it says dependent variables, I'm going to put in tear resistance, gloss, and opacity. So I've got three dependent variables, three response variables. The two experimental factors, <coughs> rate of extrusion and amount of additive, 
I could put, well, gee, I could put them either in the categorical field or the quantitative field. It doesn't really matter. There's only two levels of each. I think in the notes I went ahead and just put them in as categorical factors. I'll get the same answers regardless of where you put them. Okay. So I've got two experimental factors, two x's. I've got three dependent variables, three y's. Let's press OK. The second dialog box that comes up whenever you run <coughs> general linear models procedure asks you to specify the model. And I'm going to tell it to put in the main effect of A, the main effect of B, and also A star B. A star B means the interaction between extrusion and additive. I'll press OK. I'll take all the defaults, press OK again, and up will come the general linear models procedure. Now initially, <clears throat> it's going to analyze each variable separately. If you look at the analysis summary, for example, you'll see here an analysis of variance for tear resistance. And if you scroll down a little farther, you'll see there now at the top of the screen an analysis of variance for gloss. And if you scroll down even farther, an analysis of variance for opacity. Just out of curiosity, you might notice for tear resistance, there are small p-values for extrusion and additive, but not for the interaction. For um, opacity, uh, the p-values are actually large for all three. So it does initially give you a separate univariate analysis of variance for each variable separately. What I wanted to do, though, is I wanted to do a MANOVA. And in order to do that, I push the right mouse button. I go to Analysis Options. And there's a checkbox near the top that says Include MANOVA. So if you check the box that says include MANOVA, it's going to add to the output multivariate ANOVA tests. Okay, so what it did is it just added more to the analysis summary. So if I scroll all the way down, where is it? There it is. You will see that there is a MANOVA <coughs> for factor A. That's the rate of extrusion. There's a maneuver for factor B <coughs> that was the amount of the additive. And there's also a MANOVA for the A times B interaction. Under each of the MANOVAs, you'll see four different statistics. You'll see Wilkes Lambda. You'll see Pili trace, I think that's how you pronounce it. You'll see a hoteling lolly trace, and you'll see Roy's greatest root. The first three of those statistics have p-values associated with them. Um, in this case, they give the exact same test. That's not always the case. It depends upon what the x variables look like. <laughs> to tell you briefly, what these statistics are about. I have a slide in my PowerPoint that talks about the MANOVA tests. And what the MANOVA tests are based on is basically the sums of squares and cross products between the responses. It looks at not only the effect of the factors on the variance, the changes in the different responses, but also the covariances, the correlations between those responses. And again, I don't have time to go into all the mathematics, but if you look at something like Wilkes Lambda, which is the probably the most popular statistic, the most widely looked at when you do a MANOVA, what it does is it compares the between groups covariance matrix. That's the covariance matrix amongst my three responses between levels 
of factor A, levels of factor B, and levels of the interaction, and compares it to the within groups covariance matrix. And when you see a p-value coming out for Wilkes lambda, that basically is the equivalent of the f-test that you'd see in the univariate analysis of variance. The difference is that Wilkes lambda now is testing hypotheses about all three responses together. Basically testing the null hypothesis that a particular factor has no effect on any of the responses. Well, in this case, uh, you will notice the p-value is quite small uh, for Wilkes lambda for, for factor A, well below 0.05, so there's a highly significant multivariate effect for factor A. On the other hand, if you look at Wilkes lambda for the interaction, uh, you'll notice for the interaction the p-value is 0.3. So there doesn't appear to be any interaction between rate of extrusion and amount of additive on any of the responses looked at together. That's the major difference in the MANOVA. It allows us to look at the response variables simultaneously. And of course, we have only one p-value, assuming we only look at Wil Wilkes lambda, only one p-value for all three responses taken simultaneously. Okay. <clears throat> so it's something you might like to do in situations where you have more than one response. Okay, that's the multivariate ANOVA. It's found in stack graphics in the general linear models procedure. All right. Now, the last topic I wanted to talk about, but certainly not the least interesting, is something called partial least squares, or PLS. Partial least squares is a procedure we added, I believe we just added it in version 16, if my memory is correct designed to find the relationship between two matrices. Typically, if you're running a partial least squares, doing a partial least squares analysis, you have a set of predictor variables x and a set of response variables y. And you're interested in finding a mathematical or statistical model that relates the x's to the y's. So you've got multiple x's, multiple y's, and are basically going to fit linear models relating the x's to the y's. <clears throat> now you would say, well, typically, wouldn't I do that with something like multiple regression? I'll go ahead and, and, and do something like that. And you could if you were to look at each response variable separately. Uh, one of the nice things about um, <clears throat> partial least squares, though, is you look at all the response variables simultaneously. Another big advantage, though, of partial least squares is that the number of observations, the number of samples that you have, may be less than the number of predictor variables. And there are cases when you have lots and lots and lots of x's, more x's than you have observations. And partial least squares, because of the way it runs, can fit these mathematical models for you, even if the number of observations is less than the number of predictors. Now, what is the basic process? Well, what the basic process is, is it begins by looking for latent variables. Latent variables are like the, uh, the principal components variables we look for uh, in the principal components analysis. Latent variables are linear combinations of the x's. But rather than just looking as, as the PCA does, the principal components analysis does, for directions or combinations of the x's that maximize the variance in the x space, 
in PLS, you're looking for latent variables that explain not only a lot of the variability in the Xs, but also a large proportion of the variance in the Ys. Okay, and one of the attractive things about PLS is it's looking at the Xs and the Ys simultaneously. Now, similarly to a principal components analysis, we will be looking typically for a small number of components. Less components certainly than we have uh, variables. And often by coming up with linear combinations of the X, we, Xs, we can reduce the dimensionality to something that's a little bit um, easier to understand. Now, the data set that I'm going to use for this is a data set uh, that a friend of mine's been uh, trying to get me to look at for quite a while. Uh, it's a data set having to do with common stocks. In fact, uh, this data set, which is called plsstocks.sgd, has information on 17 common stocks. The information, uh, incidentally, comes from finviz.com. You know, I don't know if you all follow the stock market or, or whatever, but if you want lots and lots of metrics on various stocks, finviz.com uh, is a really good website to go to uh, to get these different metrics. Uh, the 17 stocks, and there's only 17 in the data set, range from Apple through Google down through AT&T and Wells Fargo. And what I thought I would do for this webinar is I would see if I couldn't use partial least squares to come up with a mathematical model that could predict the change in stock prices. Uh, the data set actually has the stock prices in it on at two different points in time. On April 4th, 2013, we know what the price was. We also know what the price was on January 8th, 2014. That's a little bit more than eight months if I counted properly. February. Uh, April, it might, might be nine months, actually. I, I said eight months in my slide, but I think I just didn't count right. January, very much, uh, yeah, I think it's, it's actually um, nine months. Whatever. I wanted to predict the change in the stock price between April 4th and January 8th. And to be fair about this, I wanted to do it based on a collection of metrics obtained back on April 4th. Okay. The file contains something like 50 different metrics that were available to anybody who went to finviz.com on April 4th. And I was wondering if I could take the metrics on April 4th and come up with a way to predict how things would have changed between then and January 8th. Now, of course, this is hindsight, but what I'm trying to do, you see, is come up with a mathematical model that maybe I could apply today to see what would happen nine months from now. And the goal, as I said, would be to build a model that could predict how things would change in the future. Now, um, to run this, I'm going to use the partial least squares procedure. And I must admit that I played around with this data quite a bit last week, uh, trying to come up with what I thought was a useful, interesting model. And though I finally settled on 26 predictor variables. So the analysis I'm going to show you in just a moment has 17 samples, 17 stocks, and 26 predictor variables. Okay? 
Now, um, in order to make this a useful analysis, um, we're going to have to do some sort of validation. Built into the partial least squares procedure is a validation method. You know, there's a lot of dangers, particularly when you're modeling stock price data, that you can come up with a mathematical model that models your data very well, but it's almost useless for predicting anything else. You know, just for example, because I get a high R squared uh, when I fit a regression model, doesn't mean that that's going to be a useful predictor of other observations. So what I decided to do when I ran the PLS here was to validate the procedure using the leave out one at a time method. Uh, it's a procedure that's actually a validation method that's built into several stack graphics analyses. What I'm actually going to do in the partial least squares procedure, I'm going to ask it to take my 17 stocks and one at a time to take the stocks out, fit the model with the 16 stocks that are left, and predict the one that I just pulled out. And I'm going to do, ask it to do that 17 times. I'm going to tell it, go down and one by one, take out each of my stocks, fit whatever model you're fitting, and see how far off your prediction would be of the stock that was not included in the model. And as you'll see, the primary statistic it'll give for me is something called PRESS, the prediction residual sum of squares. And it's very, very important, particularly when you've got lots and lots of variables in the model, that you look at how well it's able to predict observations not used to fit the model. Now, another way to do it would be to just leave some of the stocks out of the model fit. I could tell it, for example, to leave five stocks out and fit with the other 12. Problem is, I've only got 17, and I really don't want to give up uh, any of my stocks. So the best, next best thing to do, rather than taking a whole set of, of, of other stocks, is to do this procedure where you take one out at a time, refit, uh, and see what sort of statistics you get. Okay, now let me show this to you. Let me show you how it all works. Let me go back to stat graphics, close off the current stat folio, and now pull up an analysis that I've already done uh, called PLS1. This is a stat folio where I've already uh, gone ahead and done a partial least squares analysis. Um, I want to save a little time here, and since there are so many variables, it would take me a lot of time. Uh, to figure out um, and put it in on the fly. But I'll just call it up and, and show you what you get out of the partial least squares. Uh, here is the partial least squares, and you can see a summary of the data. There is one variable gain. That is the percent gain in the stock price, how much it went up between April 4th of last year and January 8th of this year. I specify this part of the model 26 independent variables. Things like the moving average of the last 200 observations, a 52-week low, beta, the payout ratio, the profits, performance, volatility, volumes, uh, insider ownership, institutional ownership, return on assets, return on investment. Uh, the peg ratio earnings per share. And I'm going to ask the procedure to build me a mathematical statistical model involving all of those variables. Now remember though, of course, I've only got 17 stocks. The model will involve 26 variables. 
So one of the critical things that you need to worry about is how many components you want to put into the analysis. Now, if I look at the analysis summary and I scroll down a ways, it'll give me an interesting table. Um, and in fact, the table I gave you, I think, in the notes, and again, you can download my PowerPoint slides after I'm done, is this table right here. What happens in a parcel of these squares is you first go in and extract one component. Find one linear combination of those 26 variables. Okay? That explains a large proportion of the variation in both the x's and the y's. Okay? And here you see in the table uh, for example, right here, cumulative percent of the axis. You can find one component in the space of the axis that measures 22% of the variation in the axis. It also measures 62% of the variation in the y's. Now that sounds great, doesn't it? I mean, here I've got one linear combination of the axis that's capable of giving me an R squared of about 62.5%. Unfortunately, over on the right-hand side, you see the average prediction R squared. If I fit it to all 17 stocks, a one-component model, I get about a 62% R squared, 62.5% R squared. However, if I start taking the stocks out one at a time, fit with the other 16 stocks and try to predict the ones that I took out and calculate the press, the predicted residual sum of squares, and from that a prediction R squared, I find out that the model, even though I gave a 60, got a 62.5% R squared for the Ys, has a prediction R squared of zero. That means it's no better than a model that contains only a constant term. Okay, that's the way you can definitely fool yourself by putting lots uh, of variables in the model. Well, you can do that for one component, you do that for two components, you do that for three components, for four components, for five components, and so forth. And what you notice is something quite interesting. If you put only one, two, or three components in the model, the prediction R squared is zero. The model's no better than a constant. However, as soon as you get to four components, something happens. And you get a prediction sum of squares of an R squared of about 56%. Now, after four, it starts to go back down again, and if you put too many variables, it'll go all the way back to zero. You can also see this, incidentally, in the model comparison plot. The model comparison plot will show you the percent of the variation, the R squared, if you like, uh, which the model represents if you use one component, two components, three components, up to ten components. It'll show you the R squared for the Ys, which is the one you normally look at. It also so shows you, though, the percent of variation in the Xs that's been explained. <coughs> Excuse me. And finally, the press statistic. And what you notice is that in this case, if you underfit the model, you don't use enough components, it's not useful. If you overfit the data, you use too many components, it's also not very useful. On the other hand, there seems to be something special <coughs> excuse me, about that fourth component. As soon as I put that fourth component in the model, I got about a 56% R-squared, uh, which, is, which is pretty good. 
<coughs> excuse me, I have a little bit of a cold here too today. Um, actually, 56% R squared. I was jumping up and down when I saw that. Stock prices are notoriously hard to predict. And again, remember, I'm using data from nine months ago to try to predict what would happen today. And the fact that I could actually get a 56% prediction R squared was something that, that I thought was pretty neat. Now, to show you a little bit about what the final model is, I'm going to hit the right mouse button, go to Analysis Options, and tell it to reduce my model to four components. Okay. I'm now going to also look at two additional plots. I'm going to look at the PLS coefficient plot and also a factor plot. Now remember, what I'm getting in my final model is a linear combination of the x's based upon the four components that I extracted, which I'm using to predict how much the stock price went up. If you look at the standardized coefficients, and that's what the PLS coefficient plot plots, if you look at the standardized coefficients, the largest standardized coefficient is on institutional ownership. What that says is at least for these 17 stocks, and I have to qualify it, for these 17 stocks, if you looked at the institutional ownership nine months ago, you know, how much of the stock was owned by institutions, that was the most important factor in predicting how much the stock would rise between last April and um, this January. Leads me to believe that the institutions must have people that know what they're doing. Uh, the more the stock was owned by institutions, the more the stock price went up. Or they could just be driving the price up, I'm not sure. But anyway, there was a positive relationship. Second most important factor, at least according to the coefficients, is EPS, earnings per share. That also has a positive effect. The higher the earnings per share last April, the more the stock price went up. The strongest variable with respect to negative effects is back here, on the other hand. It is the payout ratio. What the payout ratio is, is a measure of what percent of the earnings were paid out in dividends. Okay, so it, it relates to uh, the amount of dividends paid. A negative effect here, negative coefficient, would imply that the more they paid out in dividends, the less well the stock did over the next nine months. Okay, now again, it's all qualified. This is what happened over the last nine months on these 17 stocks. Um, You know, I don't guarantee that model is going to make you any money in the future, but it is interesting and it certainly demonstrates what the partial least squares models can do. One final plot to look at is the PLS factor scores plot. As I said, what you do in partial least squares is something similar to what would be done in principal components analysis is that you look for dimensions in the space of the axis. They're not just the principal components, though, because they're also those dimensions selected so as to maximize the variance of the Ys. So you've got both the predictive variables and the explanatory variables in place. But if you look at the component plots, you can see, at least here, the first two of the four components and where the stocks fall, the individual stocks on those two components. The first component seems to contrast you know, high-tech stocks like Google and Apple 
with the more traditional companies like AT&T, General Electric, Procter and Gamble, um, Caterpillar, I think, is, is CAT. So that seems to be a little bit more of a contrast, and here's Oracle, of high-tech stocks versus traditional stocks. Uh, in this case, the high-tech stocks, uh, of course, have done quite well over the last nine months. Second factor, second dimension, is a little less obvious. In fact, I'm not, still not quite sure how to interpret it. Because on the second dimension, I have at one extreme Apple and at the other extreme Google. In fact, up, up on the high side of factor two, you have Google and Halliburton and CVS and Honeywell. Uh, and down here you have Apple, Apple, FCX, Caterpillar, and so forth. So one of you out there may um, have a better insight into what the second factor is. Anyway, that is a typical illustration of what partial least squares can do for you. Um, it will fit a model involving lots and lots of x variables, more x variables even than you have observations in the data set. All right, well, I've gone for about <clears throat> the hour and a half that I typically allocate here. So let me just uh, finish up with, by showing you a slide about where you can obtain more information. You can certainly go to www.statgraphics.com. Um, if, again, if you go to our webinar page there, you will see uh, that you can download the slides that I've uh, produced. Uh, and also that stock data set I've also posted for people that want to play around with that. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to go to uh, <clears throat> take a look uh, at the Uniwin Plus package, uh, www.stackgraphics.fr uh, will get you there, as will sigmaplus.fr. Uh, you may also send us, if you like, uh, any questions or queries or suggestions or whatever to info at stackgraphics.com. And you can find us, if you like, also on Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, or Twitter. OK, now, um, that is the formal presentation. Um, I was um, hoping that there might also be some questions submitted. Let me now take a look and see uh, if there were any questions uh, generated uh, during the talk. Um, I don't see any. Those of you who are monitoring this, uh, were there any questions submitted during the, uh, the course of uh, the webinar? Okay, normally they'll send me a message if there is a question that was submitted. Um, I didn't think I was that clear today, but hopefully I was. Okay. Also, I, I want to give a shout out to my friend George Dyson uh, for uh, putting together that uh, set of uh, stock price data. Um, <clears throat> he'd been uh, asking me to take a look at it for quite a while, and uh, I'd been doubtful that I would find anything significant. You know how it is when you dig into stock prices and try to predict what happens with stocks. So the fact that the partial least squares was able to come up with a, a model that seemed to have pretty good predictive uh, ability um, was uh, very encouraging. All right, I don't see any questions. Uh, so if there are questions, if you would, um, go ahead, uh, email them to us, info at stackgraphics.com, and I'll try to answer those for you. Uh, hopefully you'll give these four procedures, um, the correspondence analysis, the multiple correspondence analysis, uh, 
the MANOVA and the partial least squares procedure a try. Uh, they're, as I said at the beginning, perhaps not as heavily used as they could be. Okay. In that case, I'm going to sign off. Uh, we'll post on StackGraphics.com and we'll send you emails uh, when the next uh, webinar is going to be scheduled. Till next time, take care.